jump into the opposite end of the scale from the micro scale to the traditional knowledge scale. So, uh, woohoo! <laughs> hey, I'm so happy to see so many uh, botanists here. Botanists are my favorite people. I worked in the Middle East and we all argued about plants from different countries there too. But for the 60 students that are here, welcome. I can tell you, it's a great life in the field. So you're you're starting just the most wonderful, magical way you can start your world when you're out in the field and turn off the news. Life is good, you know what I mean? <laughs> so hopefully I can get the technology. I think I'm missing, oh, let's go. Okay, I'll try to uh, get this one. Where's my little friend? <laughs> oh, okay, there. So I turn that here, and then does this talk here? Oh, I'm so good. <laughs> anyway, I'm working on a project for about uh, five years uh, called Bushy Lake, and uh, it's near Sac State, and it's near the Cal Expo. It's a very urban area. Um, I've been working there since about 2015. It's had several fires. It started at fires at the Ecological Society of America conference and UC Davis and Yale. And a bunch of us started there doing kind of studying where the, um, the impacts of fire. So this is where my restoration site is. You can see this little green area from the 2016 and uh, I involve students a lot in the project. It's owned by uh, Cal Expo, and it's managed by Sacramento County Parks. It was almost a golf course, and then uh, Sacramento Valley Conservancy, uh, SARA, Sa Sacramento Save the American River Association, saved it, as I say, from the jaws of hell, and now it's a wildlife area, but it was neglected, and nobody even knows about it, which is sort of good to not have homeless people camping there. But uh, we've been studying it for five years, and basically doing by learning. So we have three goals. One is to protect, enhance, and restore a habitat refuge. Two is to enhance and study the habitat for bioresilient native flora and fauna. And three, and enhance the parkway uh, in terms of both natural history education, but also um, to really have a living lab for the traditional cultures on the Sacramento River and honoring California Indian, um, Indian cultures. And I really want to thank the ancestors of this land for allowing us to be in their territory. I also want to honor my own heritage of Nez Pierce from the Colville Confederated Tribes because my, my dad and my aunt are just kind of losing their stories in their, in their last years, so I'm really cherishing uh, my own culture at the same time. We've had a lot of students out there. We've had a lot of fun, a lot of community engagement citizen science um, and part of the goal is to involve the community in the restoration and in connection with nature out there. So let's define our terms since we haven't really had much at this conference on uh, traditional knowledge uh, or traditional management per se. What is ecocultural restoration? It's uh, land is with so the land I'm studying is within the t historic and sovereign territory of the Nisimon people. And the point of this project is to deliber deliberately incorporate cultural aspects into the restoration. For any of you who have been around for a while, you know as we really started restoration ecology, we started using, instead of just going out and playing recreational bulldozer, we started to actually use scientific techniques. We used reference ecosystems. Then there's been a shift away from that, where I've actually heard people, you know, the novel ecosystem concept of the past does not inform the future. And ecocultural restoration, the experiments we're doing out there, the paradigm shift is in a highly disturbed urban area to still maintain these cultural 
culturally significant plants, relationships with plants, and honoring the First Nation people whose land we're in. Another term I want you to think about if you haven't heard it before is culturally, uh, cultural keystone species as opposed to an ecological keystone species where, where spe plants are very, very important to people. You can think of salmon as being relational to both native people and to many of us who love seeing them come back to our rivers. And in the, in the case of this project and my research, it's white root or Carex barberae, which is not only a really important plant to California Indian basket weavers, um, but it's also, it's tending on the pre-European colonialization landscape, uh, really affected the ecosystems uh, in our California landscape. The research trajectory is to honor and respect local tribal members, many of whom I've had the uh, really great privilege of working with um, since the 1990s, and to include that cultural knowledge in the restoration and in the community outreach. Probably all of you have seen some background in traditional knowledge or traditional resource management. I think all of you that I've talked to, which is not that many, but I think you're all seeing that we're starting to incorporate traditional knowledge into botany, more than just ethnobotany or what plants do for people, but our relationship with plants. One of the things in some of my recent publications, uh, I've been kind of teasing out how do we look at both scientific ecological knowledge and traditional knowledge and traditional knowledge includes the knowledge practices and beliefs about uh, the relationship of living beings to one another and to the physical environments held by indigenous people with a direct dependence on local resources. And we touched on that in the fire talk last night. Um, I also encourage you to read some of Robin Kimmerer's work on reciprocal ecology the mutually reinforcing restoration of land and cultures has such that repairing ecosystem services contributes to cultural revitalization, renewal of culture, promotes restoration of ecological integrity. Please note this is not a past tense, this is a present and future tense. Please note that everyone lives in a place and everyone has a reciprocal relationship with the land we live with and I can hear that in every talk I've heard from you. I can see that it's in all these different ways and I've really enjoyed that. So how do we, how do we design experiments? How do we develop an eco-cultural restoration project? Most of us work, all the talks I've heard, are working with Western ecological knowledge where we use statistics and replicates, um, quantitative work, um, repeated short-term experiments, tests, sampling, peer review, uh, literature review, and sometimes traditional knowledge is considered anecdotal and less than, but it tends to be intergenerational, tends to be the knowledge of the elders, um, long-term synchronic data sets, and the oral tradition encodes a lot of information, and fortunately I'm starting to hear more of that in our in regards to the fire landscape in California. One of the things I love about what I'm doing that's really positive is this reciprocal relationship of students where we're uh, in a process of discovery and learning by doing. So I want to dispel the myth of either a pristine condition in California when the settlers got here or that novel ecosystems of past does not inform the future. I don't know how many of you have heard this, oh well, there weren't very many native here, native people, and they didn't have the technologies, so the fact that they lived here for thousands of years sustainably is irrelevant to now, to changing conditions, to invasive species, to climate change. Well, that's not true. Because we had very high densities of native people, up to 500, um, 587 people per, per square mile, uh, at least where I've been working with the Sunnis and 
American rivers. They tended diverse traditional resources. Um, they burned coppice, dug, weeded, um, collected vast amounts of material for all aspects of food, medicine, and material culture. This is a picture of gathering uh, tarweed seeds, which were used in a staple called pinoli, which is one of the things I want to start recreating, a pinoli garden. And I'm going to want your help. That's at the end. <laughs> Foreshadowing. <laughs> So the thing I've worked on for my doctorate in the last decades is Carrots Barberay or White Root. And White Root um, is both, it is a cultural keystone species. It's the most ethnobotanically important plant for basket weaving. Even more now as baskets are more fine and, uh, and artistic than just utilitarian as in the past. As you know, if you've worked in restoration, uh, Church Barbary is also God's gift to restoration. It can produce as many as 100 rhizomes in a season, stream bank stabilization. So that's just a good example of a plant that's significant from both a cultural and ecological perspective. This is something you won't see in real time. It's a gorgeous uh, feather basket but I just want you to notice the, the weaving strand, that really fine, beautiful weaving strand, is uh, the carrots barberry. And then these feather baskets are very uncommon now. This is a particularly uh, work of art. So over the five years, we've had a lot of small experiments going on out there to restore the land. I don't have time in this talk to go over the details of the experiment. I want to just kind of show you what we're doing and also uh, one experiment that's sort of a crosswalk between traditional knowledge and Western scientific knowledge. The species we selected are fire resilient because they were managed with fire by traditional resource management. Carrots Barbary, Namus Triticoides, Artemisia Douglasiano are the dominants we've been working with. Um, I have students in my restoration class out every spring, and then students doing undergraduate research now. We're starting a, a graduate program. We've started adding um, pollinator plants, fiber plants, geophytes, pinoli plants. So some of the experiments we've worked with um, are kind of standard samples, standard experiments, you know, mycorrhizae or not. Um, seed germination, but the one I want to talk to you about today, uh, Moise Murr wasn't able to be here, but he won the second place in the CSU and first place at Sac State for his undergraduate research, and what we looked at is whether this medicine plant, mugwort, kachina in, uh, in, in uh, Miwok, Artemisia Douglasiana is its third name that I know, um, we looked to see if it was an umbrella plant or a, or a facilitator plant for a native species. So we, we, we designed an experiment to grow it with the, the lamus and, and the carex. From a Western science, many native species are shade adapted and require canopy cover. Mugwort provides an early successional canopy or umbrella to facilitate a successful restoration of a full complement of understory species. And from traditional knowledge, mugwort is a very important spiritual medicine plant that brings in the sweetness of spirit. It's used on the altars um, for um, sweat lodge ceremony, at some, uh, funerals at just smudging. It's a very, and other uses that are medicine uses. So the hypothesis was if we interplanted uh, carex and elemis with the artemisia, it would facilitate their growth. This is going to have to be really short. Um, I can talk to you more after it or we're going to publish it. So the experimental design, which shows up there but not on my slide, was either to plant Carex by itself, lamus by itself, or underplanting it with the artemisia. And uh, this is Moise. And in the end, basically, we had very high survivorship. We, had, we don't have supplemental watering out there. There was no difference in survivorship. 
And what we found is that there was no significant difference between the monotypic stands and the interplanted stands, so there was no sign that this was a, oh geez, that this was a uh, facilitated or umbrella species, but it did exclude the weedy species from the, the plant. So I'm gonna go pretty quickly, uh, we do observation, We've been sampling western pond turtles and fallen in love with them. They're a state-sensitive species. We have a lot of the most invasive species in the world, red-eared sliders. Um, we're going to really extend our, our research with them. This one, the top one is red-eared slider, the bottom one is the poor little uh, western pond turtle, so you can see they're competing for uh, basking sites. These are our primary basking sites from visual surveys. And next year we're going to start doing more nesting <coughs> surveys, maybe some, um, well, primarily checking and trying to see if they're nesting, where their recruitment is, and understanding more about the population. So the Pazam is, we got, we got funding! Okay, have you guys, have you guys ever just, maybe this is totally weird, but, you know, I'm out there weeding or getting heat stroke, and I'm like, geez, if I die, this will just turn back into uh, poison hemlock, and nothing will ever happen. So I'm so happy to have a lack of same. When you get a little older, like I am, you want to leave something behind. It's not about your ego. It's about wanting to leave something for the community. So we got a large grant for uh, conceptual restoration plan. We are not interested in just studying we want to put shovels in the ground and really make a beautiful site. Um, these are some of the coll collaborators, but I'll be working with Becky Rosamowicz with Area West. And my student is working for her, and we're starting a master's program. Jeff Alvarez is giving us, hey, plant people, it's really fun to diverge and start working with another organism. So he's keeping me in the in the good, uh, good way with turtles. And... Uh, then I thought this was a good last slide. So if anybody wants to talk to me or help give advice, uh, come out, help with floristic surveys, and especially help with this idea I have of doing a pinoli garden with tarweeds and medias and hamzonias and red veins and chia, uh, I'd love that. And these are just recent background, great student achievement, which is why I do it, and that's it. Thank you.